This topic, getting started with converged, hyperconverged, is something, as Eric mentioned, I've been doing every day for two years. The messaging has changed. Two years ago, the conversation was around converged infrastructure. Even two years ago with companies like VCE, it was a new thing. It was, a, it was, a, it was some people considered to be a science project. Should we adopt this or not? Early adopter phases. Today, it's changed because hyperconverged is a lexicon in the marketplace that is, that is driving rapid adoption and change again. So I don't have any conversations with customers that don't cover both. Now, we heard a lot this morning, and you'll hear a lot more today about how quickly should we adopt change and, and what is the risk cycle and adoption cycle for new technologies. How do we deal with the legacy infrastructure of the past and the client server technologies? How do we deal with the, the new DevOps? And, and how do we deal with the new web scale applications and deployments in the future? And both, both are valid ways to do business. There's the old way, there's the new way. And both infrastructure choices are valid ways of doing business. So hopefully today in a you know, short 20, 25 minutes, I'll give you an introduction to both. I know I've met a lot of you. We've probably had many briefings. Some will be new, some will be old. But uh, if you take something away that's, that's interesting or you want to have follow up, I'll be here all day. So feel free to uh, come and talk to me. Um, what I'm going to do is some of you have seen parts of this deck before. Introduction to converged infrastructure, introduction to hyperconverged, comparing the two, talking about use cases and hitting a little bit about you know, what is the market dynamics. What have we seen in the marketplace? Who are the players? How is it changing? What are the evaluation criteria? I'll start with what I would consider to be the, the reference architecture, do-it-yourself approach. The idea of converged infrastructure technologies aren't new. Blade servers, modular storage systems, fiber channel over ethernet, these are independent technologies, independent convergence of technologies, throw the hypervisor on top, that everybody's been doing. Server teams have been running Blades and, and VMware. Network teams have been trying to uh, move networking forward, whether it's 10 gig, 40 gig into the future. Modular storage systems continue to evolve. Clarion, Symmetrics, other arrays back in the, in the 1990s to all flash arrays and things we're doing today. Those are all converged infrastructure pieces, but those parts only take you so far. You still have separate teams. You still have separate management structures. You still have separate certification processes. One team tests this thing, another team tests that thing bringing them together, making them work, and running them in a data center where you can make that introduction of change risk-free is still difficult. So, so parts of convergent infrastructure only get you so far. But if we go down to that traditional build where I'm still going to have servers, and I'm still going to have modular storage, and I'm still going to have network switching, what if I bought that as a unit of data center? What if I put that together as a product? What if I shipped it in racks, pre-cabled? The, the, the pictures that Gene showed were good because there was the picture we've all seen with that crazy rat's nest, and then he showed that picture that showed a whole lot of cabling in the back of some racks that was built nicely. What if we got rid of most of that cabling in racks that were built nicely, and it showed up in your data center that way? So from a, from a value perspective, the value you're trying to create is in the DevOps space, not in the cabling space. And, and if, we can, if we can buy the infrastructure and have it just show up as a unit of data center that can scale independent vectors of storage and compute, and then I can put management systems around it that actually don't run on the same platform that are running my data. You know, hey, let's, let's separate the management plane from the data plane. That seems like a great way to ensure availability. If there's something wrong, and I need to bring the developers in, or I need to bring the DevOps people, or the ops people, or the information security people to look at a problem, and there's a performance issue, put my management tool somewhere else than what has having the performance issue. These are tenets of the design of a converged infrastructure solution. What's probably more critical, this is all fun, it's good, it's good for that upfront value prop, but the ongoing lifecycle management, single vendor support for an entire stack. Um, how about somebody testing all of the code changes for you, testing interoperability, telling you when it's safe to go to vSphere 6? Because vSphere 6 is now certified and tested to work with every other component in this product. When is it safe to go to the next version of UECS Manager? When is it safe to go to the next version of Extreme IO Code? These are things that you would typically see in a conversion infrastructure product that if you rolled your own or if you used a reference architecture, your team, your administrators are responsible for that. I'm not saying you can't do it, but is it what you want to do? Eric mentioned career evolution and change. If I'm trying to define value for my business and I'm trying to introduce the rate of change that Gene demonstrated that the big companies are doing, whether they're unicorns or the horses or the thoroughbreds, um, you can't do that if you're spending your time reading harder compatibility lists. And, and building test labs and testing physical connectivity of hardware. And if I upgrade this code, will it break this thing over here? There's other people that do it better, and that's an offering that you get with converged infrastructure. Now, this, this conversation, three years ago, early adopter phase, if I was going to throw up the bell curve, I would say it's now into rapid adoption. Um, I see a whole lot of this ahead. 
a head's business plan or a business model around helping people with data center and that, and that second pillar of the uh, head innovation framework that, that Eric showed, we don't do a lot of storage refreshes. We don't do a lot of server refreshes. That's, that's, that's kind of an old way of doing business. Convergent infrastructure seems to be where most things are going because with the flexibility of today's offerings, we can do that. But what we're seeing now is a, is a kind of a, a change, a disruptive change coming into the industry that, that you know, is making people like VCE sit up and take notice and, and launch their own products in the space is this idea of hyper-converged infrastructure. What if I could just build grids? You know, think, about, think about what the unicorns are doing. You know, millions of servers. And if servers fail, who cares? If data centers fail, well, it sucks, but who cares? The applications are written to stay up. You know, what, what we talked about with Chaos Monkey and, and what Netflix has done. If you build your applications to sustain node failure or grid failure, and you have multiple grids, and they can scale independently of vectors, and they can be distributed, I don't need to invest in five and six, nine technologies. I don't need, I don't need high speed network interconnects. I don't need six or, f or five or six, nine storage arrays. I don't need the redundancy built into VMware systems that are doing VMware HA based on blade servers with, you know, specific metrics during that workload. So on, on a hyper-converged infrastructure, I can take nodes, and those nodes will have compute, they will have hypervisor, they will have storage, they will have network, and I can just scale them. And I can scale them as large as I want, within limits, depending on the manufacturer, or I can scale them sideways, build a grid, build another grid, build another grid, create availability zones like we were talking about earlier. Um, so it's a different way to do things because if I can, if I can shed the, the requirement to have a pre-built data center and, and worry about all that cabling and, and worry about building a five nines architecture and fiber channel and, and network and all these different segregated technologies like we used to do things, I'm gonna have lower cost. And I think the, the lower cost metrics from the industry leaders in this space are driving change and adoption of these types of technologies with the traditional data center manufacturers, which, which I'm gonna talk to a little bit more. Um, if I was gonna compare the two specifically, how they work together or how they compare with each other, I would go back to convergent infrastructure. I don't care who the vendor is. You have servers, you have storage, you have network. If you have a hypervisor, you should have a management stack and it should come with infrastructure. It's pre-built. It's pre-wired, it's supported as a single entity. If I have a traditional VMware environment and with, with, with applications that are uh, web app, database, you know, maybe, M, maybe MQ, the different flavors of the data centers I used to be, have before, I just have a database. That database must be high availability. I can't span it across geographies. I can't take advantage of web type technologies. This is the five or six nines infrastructure platform that I would argue 99% of enterprise customers are still doing. My Oracle, my DB2, my SAP, my, my mission critical systems are gonna continue to run on this type of infrastructure for a while. As long as it's on-prem, this is where it's gonna be. Then I look at the grid type computing that Hyperconverge brings. I mentioned this concept of, of you know, CPU and memory and, and hypervisor, could be agnostic hypervisor, it depends on the manufacturer, and disk being the most important part because I need smart software that takes that disk and provides that disk in, in a view that all the nodes can see in a highly available fashion. I need to be able to tolerate node failure and data regeneration. Hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could actually have nodes that are just disk only and I don't have to add hypervisors, I don't have to add compute. The leading players in the hyperconverged space recognize that as a growth issue and never solve that. So I've got the ability now to scale vectors, I can, I can build these grids up, I can trust my smart software, and, and that then becomes the question on the adoption curve organizationally, risk taking wise, when and if and what use cases do you use for hyperconverged? Where in the past I have arrays with 20 years of code history for six nine platforms for storage or five nine platforms, multi controller, high availability storage platforms. Am I ready to take a leap of faith that says now I'm going to trust a new software stack? It could be vSAN, it could be Scale IO, it could be Prism, it could be many different code stacks. But you're taking a leap of faith, and there are use cases where that is absolutely a valid approach to go and go out building data center. If I was going to look at the three from the perspective of, of who's building what, uh, converged infrastructure, these are the things we talked about. These are how you've always built data centers. I say we just build it better. We can ship it better. We can get it deployed faster. You have a guaranteed unit of data center that shows up, and you can do a greenfield project. You can do an application deployment. You can do a VDI project. You know it's going to work. It's going to come in fast. Team has to be on board to make it come in fast, but it works. Um, they're manufactured as products. There's a, there's a factory somewhere that's doing the work that you used to do or that one of your partners used to do putting things in, taking care of dead parts, cabling it, applying firmware, putting your logical configuration on it, shipping it as a unit so when it plugs in, three or four days later, you're actually provisioning workload, which is a different way of thinking about building data centers. You don't typically buy parts, 
storage team buys things, server team buys things, network team buys things. It isn't three or four days after part arrival that you're provisioning workload, and that's a huge value prop. Um, and then, of course, the ongoing support lifecycle management. The fact that somebody is doing those things we talked about to make sure that it will always stay up, that it's built to stay up. Single vendor support is great, but if it never breaks, you don't need to call single vendor support. That's the goal of that type of an organization. And it is maximum scalability and flexibility. Three years ago, T-shirt size systems, small, medium, large, eh, it couldn't connect to anything else. Silos of compute infrastructure, silos of storage. It's changed. I can scale vectors, I can do data lakes, I can add a file system, I can add compute, I can add storage independent vectors, as large or as small as I want to be. I just need to make sure I start with the right footprint. If I think I'm going to scale the tens of thousands of VMs, don't put a very small system in place to start. Put in a system that can scale to support tens of thousands of VMs. This has been built by traditional data center manufacturers. I don't care if it's VCE as a combination of EMC and Cisco and VMware technologies. I don't care if it's Hitachi. I don't care if it's HP. These are traditional data center manufacturers that need to find a route to market to continue to sell what they have on the truck. And that's important. They have to be able to do that. And, and the convergence gives them that ability to do it. The threat that they face is this is the idea of, of hyperconverged infrastructure. And, and I think about the defining factors. If it's a grid of compute, how am I going to provide high availability across a grid of compute? It's the smart software that matters. It's a software-defined data center on commodity hardware. Eric mentioned hardware just gets cheaper and cheaper. That's the point. Don't worry about the hardware, just worry about the software that's taking advantage of it. And that is the magic sauce, whether it's any of the uh, Nutanix or, or vSAN or, or what VCE is doing with VxRax. If the software is built to work, then the hardware can just be a commodity. And, and that, that node-based approach at low-end scale is much cheaper than converged infrastructure. And that, that's a problem for the traditional data center manufacturers. You, know, you still get some of the same things you'd get. You typically get single vendor support. There's some questions on OEMing of, of hypervisor software or not, or companies creating their own hypervisors to be able to provide that single vendor support. Um, you get things like um, the ability to move much more quickly. If, if a converged infrastructure could be in your data center in 45 days, a hyper-converged infrastructure could be in your data center in three days. And it could be provisioning workload in a day after that. Different vectors, different use cases, but there, there's different rationale to make those decisions. A year and a half ago when we talked about hyper-converged, we really looked at it as a market disruptor. These are startup companies that are saying, this old way of doing business isn't going to work anymore. And we can be cheaper, better, faster, more agile than even the VCEs or the converged infrastructure players of the world. I think what really validated that approach, because we weren't talking about it a lot 18 months ago, what really validated the hyperconverged approach was VMware. VMware vSAN technology has been around. Nobody was really adopting it. It had more issues than not. You read Google, you go to Google and you search, and it was about outages because people were picking the wrong SCSI controllers or they didn't have cash or something else. When, when, when VMware launched Evo Rail as a product concept at VMware last year, you know, that said, this is a legitimate marketplace. We're going to have hardware commodity providers provide a platform to run a better working version of vSAN. And of course, it's dedicated to VMware, and that's what it does. But that was the start. And then you saw EMC with vSpecs Blue, and you saw 12 or 13 other manufacturers build Evo Rail products. That was probably good for Nutanix, because now there's industry recognition that this is a valid approach. The thing I find most interesting is that EMC World this year, VCE launched VxRack. You know, the, a hyper-converged stack from VCE that doesn't have Cisco in it, at least from a server technology perspective, is pretty interesting. It's a new thing for VCE. And, and, and as a coming to the party a couple years late, it'll be interesting to see how quickly they can ramp with the same types of value propositions as some of the predecessors, but maybe some different ways and some different value propositions. And I compare both of those to reference architecture and do it yourself. Um, reference architecture has existed forever. Different applications, different medical application vendors, different manufacturers. I think the most prevalent reference architecture was probably FlexPod. Came out about a year after VCE came out originally, and it was a direct competitor. You know, from a marketing perspective, it was a direct competitor. The value propositions were totally different, but it was a direct competitor. And it's interesting to see the concept of reference architecture where somebody tells you how to build it right, or you could just build your own way to do it right. The value prop changes so much over time that it, it almost doesn't make sense to talk about anymore. Because if your team is dedicated to do hardware abstraction list work and, and, and figure out your own code upgrades, you're just not focused in the right place. It, it just doesn't seem to make sense. So I have an eye chart. I'm not going to read it. Anybody wants the slides can have them. Um, or you can come talk to me and I'll share it with you. We kind of used to have just do-it-yourself reference architecture and converged. And, and I was, for the first three or four months we were talking about converged and hyperconverged, I used that same column. And, and, and then I realized there are subtle differences 
And the definition of the categories on the left to the, to the, the titles across the right, when I think about supported platforms and flexibility, I used to put red for converged infrastructure because you were just buying a product stack from a vendor and it, it was pretty inflexible. You couldn't connect things to it, you couldn't scale it. Well, now I can scale converged infrastructure systems, I can connect external systems, I can, I can manage multiple converged systems under one umbrella of software. When I look at this flexibility question with hyperconverged, it isn't what it can do, but it's about that, hey, if I'm running Nutanix with Prism, it's communicating with Prism, and, and it's, that is what it is. I can't, I can't run a NAS on it today. I can't connect it to something else. I can't use the servers in this connected to fiber channel storage over there. It is, it is, a, an, it is an appliance approach that gives a specific use case. And I don't care if it's Nutanix or if it's vSAN or if it's, or if it's VX Rack. That's just how it is. It is faster. We'll see if there's more risk. Right now, from an adoption curve perspective, I would say that the hyperconverged systems are on a early adopter route, but they're moving up the bell curve rapidly. They can't not move up the bell curve rapidly when every major industry player is shifting to provide a product in that space, because there's clearly a need and a use case for it. So you know, we, we talked long and hard at the beginning of this year when we did our corporate kickoff, and, and my infrastructure team, Brian Sir, Jan Yubago, guys on my team, yeah, that focus on this and talk about it every day, we said, well, how would we evaluate? What would we recommend to customers at the highest level about when and how do we evaluate these different use cases? And, and we broke it down into these categories on the left. It's not meant to be inclusive. And the categories on the right, yeah, they could all be maybes. But I think about infrastructure as a service, hybrid cloud, production at scale, in, in the traditional data center sense. My, my traditional tiered application layer, that is, the, that is the hallmark for converged infrastructure. That's what it's built for. Five or six, nine platforms just built to run and let VMware do HA. I think about hyperconverged and, and traditional, traditionally developed applications, not web scale applications. Am I ready yet to say I'm going to put my tens of thousands of production workload or my thousands of production workload on, on these hyperconverged boxes? People are doing it, and there's nothing wrong with it. It's that risky evaluation process that Eric talked about. Are we ready? It seems to be working. There's a track record. I don't have enough field installed numbers to show five or six nines yet. I will get that over time. That's why I call it early adopter. I think about web scale, uh, Gen 3 applications, things that can tolerate node failure, things that can tolerate grid failure, things that can tolerate uh, data center failure, because the application resiliency is built in. Those things that Netflix have done is crazy. It, it will cost more to put that on converged infrastructure, because I'm buying network switching and five and six nine storage arrays and things that my application doesn't need. If my, if my application is smart enough not to need that, then don't buy converged. That's the, that's the recommended use case for hyperconvergence, and you'll see that marketing from every player in the industry. If I think about things like VDI, converged infrastructure a year and a half ago didn't make sense. VDI at scale with spinning disk was just you know, hundreds of drives, cabinets of disk at a very bad cost metric per user to, to support you know, linked clones, to support consolidated I.O. In, in a very little footprint. The, the, the generation of flash technologies that have come out makes converged infrastructure for VDI at large scale cost effective. Because if I have thousands of users, even though I'm buying network switching and five nine storage arrays and racks and cables and everything else, I can get a good cost metric. If I have less than 1,000 users, hyperconverged is probably the best way to go because I don't have to pre-buy all that other infrastructure. And it even makes more sense if I buy multiple grids because then I can use a connection broker and if I lose an entire grid, well, I lost a grid but my connection broker can restart my sessions on other grids. People that are looking at converged infrastructure for VDI are thinking about two. One here and one there, and if I lose one, I can fail over my whole workload. That is a good use case for, for hyperconverged. I would look at things like medical platforms, database systems, um, you know, traditional big iron applications that are running businesses. You know, you're going to architect those to run based on specific specifications. Uh, we do a lot of SAP work, and we have to follow a lot of rules. We do a lot of epic healthcare work, and we have to follow a lot of rules. Uh, the people here that work in healthcare know what that's all about. Um, they require certified platforms. Certification for hyperconverged is coming. In some cases, it's there. In some cases, it's not. Early adopters will buck the system and say, I'm just going to go ahead and run my system here if I want to. And that will cause adoption and certification to happen. But it's not quite there yet. It's too early. I think about the, the next two categories, legal vertical. You know, if I, if I have really high-powered databases that need a lot of I.O., and then I need petabytes of file storage. Hyperconverged isn't a NAS. Somebody might write a NAS head for a hyperconverged box, but I'd rather trust people that have been writing NAS code for 15 years than somebody writing a new NAS code that's never been tested before for a large mission critical scale. And, and, and unless I'm going to run Windows file servers as my file shares at 
hundreds of them, to get to scale, it doesn't make sense to put it on, on um, hyperconverged. Or maybe I use hyperconverged with an as on the side, which we've kind of positioned a couple times. Um, and then Robo. Robo is the hardest one out there because to build a data center resilient infrastructure at an enterprise scale and a remote office branch location is just tough. You know, the Evo didn't fix that. The, the, the VBlock 100 didn't fix that. Nutanix with large nodes is probably as close as, or smaller nodes is probably as close as you're going to get. Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a tough one. And, and that's, you know, the, more interestingly from the perspective is, is hyperconverged or converged right answer for Robo is do any market players want that space? Do any of the enterprise market players want that? Because if they get into Robo, what went from thousands of customers at enterprise scale and enterprise smarts and support organizations that built that now turns into tens or hundreds of thousands of users with different level of sophistication that could, could swamp a support organization at that scale. So it'll be interesting to watch the robo remote office play and, and see how that changes over time. But this is kind of a traditional approach to evaluating both. And I think this will be, continue to be updated probably every three months or more frequently as use cases adopt and technologies are adopted. I wasn't going to talk about use cases for Converge because it's a typical data center. I think most people know those. I just wanted to throw this one slide up that showed a couple ideas for how you could use hyperconverged. Uh, and again, it's, it's a concept of nodes with smart software. It doesn't necessarily matter who. Each one has a different value proposition. The players that have been in the market for a long time have a mature code base, and they have a value proposition that built over time on how they do things. The players that are coming into the market have been able to see other people work for three or four years on how to get it done and come in right out of the gate hot with same or better features um, with different intelligence software sets, with different use cases. But I think that, that web-based application, that, that broker-based VDI systems, that Gen 3 application cloud-ready systems, you're going to be able to show your CIOs and your CEOs that are reading the magazines about Azure and Amazon and everybody else, I can build a cloud-scale application across data centers cheaper than going outside. And your security people will probably like that, and there's less contracts and other things. So that's a, that's a pretty good use case. The remote office, branch office, the non-production virtualization platform, I think those are all things we can talk about today. I don't know how far down the road you're going to go on, on completely virtualizing your production data centers on hyperconverged yet. So I got a couple minutes left. Um, this is a slide that I kind of use as a history slide to kind of talk about the evolution of converged and hyperconverged. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. I'll say this. I think from analyzing the marketplace, VCE has clear market lead. There are other people that have shipping converged infrastructure proxies, uh, Hitachi and HP. The IBM story is interesting, this Lenovo thing, and, and, and everybody's trying to work with Cisco now. So, you know, HP is working with Cisco for switching. Hitachi is working with Cisco for servers, which puts them down to the reference architecture. Um, it's an interesting situation. If anybody follows VC over the last six to 12 months, the, the kind of the, the change from a joint venture to a, a part of EMC has given VCE the ability to do things in the hyperconverged space. You see the VX rack. This one, this one bothered me a little from the perspective of how do I slot this? Where do I put it? it it's a, it's a hyperconverged product, but it ships and racks with network switches and from a factory with single call support and an RCM. So it's a converged infrastructure product built on hyperconverged pieces. That's why I have it spanning both. But I think you'll see more focus on the hyperconverged space. The thing that I find most interesting, and I'm a little frustrated, this Magic Quadrant was released June 14th of last year. Every day for the last two weeks preparing for this, I've been looking at Gartner, do you have this year's? Because this is now exactly one year and four days old. And, and I find it, I'll give Gartner credit, they did have some Plivity Nutanix as visionaries you know, last year. When, when it was really starting, this, is, this could be an interesting place. And they did have VC in the top right, where I think they still belong to be. V, VX Rack and Evo Real didn't exist yet. I don't know where they're going to be. So what I'm thinking is will be most interesting in the next few weeks, I expect, when, when Gartner does publish something, will there be one? Will they drop FlexPod? Because FlexPod is reference architecture. It is not a converged infrastructure or hyper-converged infrastructure. Will they have one system or one quadrant that evaluates everything? Or will they have a converged infrastructure quadrant and a hyper-converged quadrant separate? I, I, I wish they would have done it before the meeting because I think it would have been fascinating to talk about today. But I think from the perspective of an introduction, uh, talking about the market and the use cases, I hope you found this useful.